Holy Spirit, from God Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and at all time, and forever and ever. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together. As you promised us, if two or three people are gathered in your name, you will be among them. We ask you, Lord, to be sitting with us so that we can learn something for our benefit and for our children and all the society. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you because you brought the love to our speaker today so that he took the time and the efforts to be with us, to teach us. It is greatly appreciated, Lord, and we are sure that you are going to reward him handsomely for doing these efforts to help us. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless the food which we are about to eat as you bless it, the five loaves and two fish and make us work for the food for eternal life. Through the intercession of St. Mary the Virgin, St. George, St. Louis and all your saints. To turn, uh, turn off our phones um, just out of respect for everybody uh, so that we're able to hear the speaker and uh, our hearts open to hear the message as well. So, good morning everybody. Welcome to uh, the first quarterly education seminar of 2020. So, God willing, the, the, the vision of uh, Abu Narwais and all the fathers um, for the church is to have an educational session quarterly. So, to have a subject and God willing, we are going to continue um, this service and hopefully you guys can pray for it. So, um, just in case you guys did not know, but it was Groundhog Day today. So, Phil did not see his shadow. So, it's an early spring. So, I'm bringing the good news for everybody. So, uh, with that out of the way, it's lovely to see you all here and I can feel the excitement. So, thank you. Um, here, obviously, to deliver today's message, uh, it's uh, his very honored and prestigious guest, Dr. Gordon Cole, and uh, joining him. Joining him uh, is his team um, of fellow doctors and ministers, his wife, Dr. Annie Han. His friend, Dr. Gord Lawson. And his wife, Dr. Susan Jealous. Thank you all for being here. Please try to join me to give them a big, huge welcome. So I can go on and on about Dr. Ko, um, accolades, but just in summary, uh, he's a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation, psychiatry, uh, medical physiatry, and medical director of the fibromyalgia. Uh, Functional Medicine Clinic at Sunnybrook Health Science Center, University of Toronto, and the Canadian Center for the Integrative Medicine in Markham. So he incorporates an interdisciplinary approach, having pioneered pain therapy. Um, his research was cannabis-based medicine for neuropathetic pain resulted in incorporation for the 2012 Canadian Pain Society Guidelines for FMS. Management and the review paper was Medical Cannabis, a Canadian Perspective in 2016 and Medical Cannabis Education, an Opioid Tempering Guide 2018. So, aside from all those hard-earned accomplishments that makes him obviously a front-runner and expert in his field, I want to share a little uh, story of how Dr. Ko touched me personally. So I was taking a course last year and uh, Dr. Gordon was one of the panelists and he was giving, going on and on obviously, um, you know, in terms of uh, in-depth with the scientific and psychological reason and effect of through his lecture um, about you know, substance abuse as one would expect. But however, what kind of a little bit made the difference is he sure emphasized throughout his lecture the sanctity of the human body as the temple of God. 
between all his scientific talks. So uh, that is something that really personally stuck with me. Um, so thank you. And from a fees perspective, he and his wife, Dr. Annie, um, have served at the Richmond Hill Christian Community Church for over 20 years, and along with their four children, yes, it does not show, but yes, four children have helped overseas in several medical missions. In 2017, Dr. Ko completed his PhD in pastoral counseling. Beside leadership role in Bible study fellowship, he and his wife, Shira, asked him to equip servant leaders with the Adapt Your Wellness Matters approach. So, um, I think I'm pretty sure that this all what you guys want to hear from me. So without further ado, I hand the mic to Dr. Ko. Let's all give him a giant round of applause, please. Praise God. Now, some of you I cannot see. So if you want to change and see, then it would be good. Or move your seats. I like to look at my my fellow Christians eye to eye, just like when I talk to my patients eye to eye. And if someone starts to go, then I'm going to ask them, what did you eat for breakfast? Right? That's one of the important questions. So we like to embrace this with an understanding that we need to look at the body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. And why are we disgracing our body, our bodies, like you do not want to disgrace our, our cathedrals and our churches. Likewise, we should not disgrace the temple of, our, 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 of the Holy Spirit, our bodies. So it's so important that we have to be very careful with what we put into our mouth. And also what we watch, look at, what we listen to. Especially, I don't see too many teenagers here, so I was going to show a picture of some. Well, there's a few. <laughs> too many iPhones, right? So, so uh, I thought I would start off. Um, everybody's got pretty good attention. I was going to show something funny. Do you want to see something funny yeah. before I get into serious? Okay. So, this is what happens on a, on a very wintry morning. So I can, 
Okay. Oh, yes, Father Bruce. Our priest is. I the father of confession for many youth of the church. The person who is, who is taking marijuana always does the opposite what the advice of the father of confession is. And I noticed a drastic change like this. Before taking the marijuana, he can go along with what and he or she can go along with what is the advice. But after taking the marijuana, there is no way. It's just his way, her way, or the highway. And the other thing, what I noticed, this is stage one. Stage two the, of the problem, that after the person takes marijuana, then he doesn't, he or she does not achieve well in the society, in his study, or his work. And when he or she is not achieving well in the study, the person start, starts to be depressed because he lags behind his or her colleague. And then when the person lags behind everybody else and unable to achieve, then the person starts to be depressed. And what I see that there are many cases that the two phenomena goes hand in hand, the marijuana and depression, and the two of them are there, and I'm left in a dilemma. What to do with a person who is depressed and who is taking marijuana? Number one, he resists taking any medication. The hardest thing to get him or her to take medication, no. He doesn't agree, and he will not agree. How to get him to the specialists in order to be treated? How to get her in order to be treated? Be my guest. My guest. It's not gonna, it's very hard. It is just like a miracle. You need a miracle from this combination. The depression and the addiction to marijuana, the two of them go hand in hand, and we have so many cases in the church that we are suffering from. Father was. So I will talk about that, but it's called the good, bad, and the ugly. So to be, um, bring a smile, I'm gonna talk about the good first, and then we'll talk about the bad and the ugly. That's a very, very important uh, uh, concept. So I'm gonna hyperlink my slides. Um, actually, let me see if I have this here. Um, I have, a, you know, I, I go through the University of Toronto and de declaring my uh, speaker de disclosures with the University <coughs> of Toronto. I've done many talks uh, we do use um, different therapies to help people get better when they're in chronic pain. So we do use botulinum toxin injections, for, especially for our stroke patients. I have spoken for different mar medical marijuana companies. And also we do injections with your own blood called platelet-rich plasma. Uh, we're in the process of doing stem cell injections as well. And there's, it's, a, it's really a team approach. Um, the learning objectives today will be distinguishing between medical and recreational. So it, if I had to say, if you were to learn one point, medical is good when prescribed by a doctor. Medical is used as a gateway out of bad drugs. So if you were taking Tylenol extra strength for your arthritis, if you take two of these 500 milligram tablets a day. The, the study out of the New England Journal of Medicine shows that after 30 years, your risk for dialysis, going kidney failure, is 4.5 times higher. There's a hidden kidney damaging side effect from a lot of our drugs. And so a lot of our patients are taking chronic pain drugs, especially the morphine drugs. So. We look at the medical side of using the safer medical marijuana approaches to get people to get off the drugs that are potentially more dangerous. The more natural, the better in many ways. Right? At the same time, we need to know the difference between recreational marijuana, 
as a gateway drug into addiction. You think it's benign, it actually will lead into addiction. I, I will certainly be talking about that. I won't have time to talk about the scientific evidence, and you know, I want to give you some really good um, pearls or tips that you can talk to your family about this, especially if you are very old or very young. And so where, did, where does marijuana come from? It actually was created by God. It's one of the plants that was created by God. And we read about this in, in Genesis 1 verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed, and God saw that it was good. But with the fall of man and sin and death, things get distorted, right? And remember, marijuana is just one plant that God created. There are other plants besides the marijuana plant. There is the foxglove plant that we derive digitalis from. And so, some of you who are on heart medication, this is a basic medication to stabilize the rhythm of the heart. And we know about the poppy medication that makes morphine drugs. The problem if you eat a lot of morphine is it can make you stop breathing. And that's why we have this opioid crisis right now. When I was doing my um, basic, uh, my advanced cardiac life support renewal, it was led by a paramedic from Barrie with over 30 years of experience. And I asked him, how many overdosed potential deaths are you seeing? And he says, every shift, uh, his team goes out, there was at least two people, usually teenagers, overdosed. They would stop breathing on fentanyl or morphine type medications. In fact, if you are, if you stop right now and you, you stop breathing, when the paramedics come in here, they will right away, besides stabilizing your airway, they will give you sugar in the vein and also Narcan, which blocks the morphine receptor. So we have this opioid crisis. And then we have also other uh, plants that God created, like tobacco, that is addictive too, and is linked with cancer and uh, uh, you know, emphysema. Right? So God created these things. Now I want to explain to you what marijuana is. Marijuana is a plant, and there are different types of plants, but there's two big types. There's a sativa type of plant and the indica type of plant. Sativa indica. And if those of you who have bad arthritis or bad nerve pain and you want to stop your morphine drugs and your doctor is skilled, he or she will put you on medication to reduce the pain and inflammation. So the sativa plant is a taller plant. And you can remember, the taller plant, it's uplifting. You can use it in the daytime. The indica plant makes you go to sleep. So another way to remember is indica is in the couch. Right? So remember, you have to know that difference. Because your, your teenager or your, um, maybe your uh, a friend in, in really having severe pain or cancer, right? they may be put on different things. And the, the, the worst mistake is not to get supervision. You go to the, because it's recreational, someone gives them something to try. You may be given something that will make you not sleep. Or you may be driving a car, taking the wrong thing, which makes you sleep, and then you get into an accident. Right? So the, make sure you realize that there's a sativa indica. Now there's all these hybrid strains, so this, this rule doesn't really apply as much anymore. But with science, we've learned that there are many, many chemicals, many types of cannabinoids in the marijuana plant. And it's the female flowering plant which has these, um, something called um, uh, these oils that are produced, right? And the, the, the plant, if you just chew it, it won't work. You have to heat up the plant. You have to combust it to make it active for the active ingredient. Now, so remember sativa and indica. That's number one. Number two, what you should know is the two main ingredients in the plant is THC and CBD. THC, remember this rule, high THC when it's smoked is recreational. High THC when it's smoked is recreational. That's when people, especially the youth, will want to smoke this so they feel high. Right? 
It's like drinking alcohol. They want to feel high. So if you, someone wants high THC from me, I won't give it to them because I suspect that they're requesting something that will make them more addicted. So THC high will make you feel high and has side effects. The medical cannabis is the CBD. CBD will not make you feel, you know, you know, psychologically uh, uplifted. CBD is good for pain and inflammation. It's anti-inflammatory. And if you, you can't see this very well, but here are the health benefits of THC, which has been studied the most, only four benefits. But look at the effects of CBD. It is anti-arthritis, anti-inflammatory. It's actually good for your bones. It's good for your liver. It's actually anti-diabetic. It has potential benefits in all these fields. It's actually being used for people with psychosis, schizophrenia even, and Parkinson's disease. They're finding some really good results with the medical CBD. So that's the distinction one needs to make. Now, I will show you an example of a, of a patient of mine. <laughs> So this is this is the um, this is the good. Okay, this is the good. Um, the um, this is a lady, 50 year old public health nurse, mother of two. She had arthritis in her body, neck, back, migraines. Um, she had a father who died from Hodgkin's cancer. She was quite overweight, um, 240 pounds. She was tender over her whole body. Her scan showed arthritis in her shoulders, ankles, feet, and in the spine as well. Um, she was not depressed. Her depression score was, was pretty okay. And this was back, uh, when was this? This was back in 2003 when I first saw her. Right? Now back then we did not have um, medical marijuana that we have now. So she had tried all these type of medications, all the drugs, um, morphine drugs, but she's allergic to, to codeine. She has been on migraine drugs, glucosamine, fish oil, and she had tried physiotherapy, uh, all sorts of non-drug therapies as well. So I put her on the marijuana pill. Did you know there's a marijuana pill that's been around in Canada since 1982? It's actually approved for people with cancer with nausea and vomiting. Right? It's, the, it's the synthetic THC form. So I put her on that back in December 2003, and they had, they had a one milligram dose, so she was put on that at nighttime. And here, she was the first to respond to me that after about two weeks getting over the dizziness and those type of symptoms, she felt much better with her pain. In fact, she said, this medication has been the best for my pain relief, and she was able to stop her anti-inflammatory drugs. And that was her picture when she, we presented her poster at a, at a meeting. And by two years later, she was on the highest dose possible. Two milligrams of this marijuana pill called Sesame. Two milligrams in the morning and four milligrams at night. But over the years, she's developed tolerance. So if you put on a medication for pain after two, three, four years, the brain receptors are all overloaded and it doesn't work as well. So she had to go off it. She tried many, many drugs. Um, and, uh, you know, as you're not medical, I'm just going to skip over the type of drugs she had. Uh, she had all sorts of injections done uh, where they burned the nerves and the uh, joints and the spine and uh, they gave her infusions of freezing. And she came and uh, saw us at the Apollo Clinic in November of uh, five years ago, or four years, four or five years ago. So she was put on a medical marijuana brand at that time. Uh, this is with the uh, vaporizer. And you can see the sativa and high CBD. So when you're using it medically, you always use high CBD. You do not want to get someone stoned or you know or anxious or depressed, right? And she felt, felt she felt really good with this using a vaporizer, and she was able to come off a lot of her medications. But then she started coughing and ha like really having a bad. Uh, problem with the smoke. So she uh, was transitioned to the oils. 
that you can take, and again, it's high CBD, 20% CBD, only 1% THC, and using that in the daytime, and a, a little bit more of a mixture of, of THC at night to help with sleep. And with that, she was able to um, really get stabilized with her pain off most of her pain drugs. In fact, she started to reduce some of her naturopathic supplements. And that's her in January of last year getting some Botox injections with us. But this has really, really helped her, right? So that is the good. You can use it medically. It's got to be prescribed. It should be high CBD. And right now, we don't tell people you should use the vaporizer because, um, because of the lung effects. It's better to use the oil. And they now have topicals for that. Now, what about the risks? So, I want to ask, you know, to be honest, so how many of you have pain right now? Like, anybody with some pain issues? So I have samples here, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. okay, how many of you right now have marijuana in your body? Oh, oh okay. Good. Very good. You know, well, the risk we have to kick them out. Of well, did you know everybody should put their hand up? But did, did you know that God created us with marijuana in our body? Did you know that? We have marijuana in our body. Just like we have morphine created from the poppy seed, God created us with endorphins in our body, which works on the morphine receptors in our body. God created us with marijuana receptors in our body. And our body produces marijuana. But not the plant marijuana, it's something called anatomide, what we call endocannabinoids. Right? So, you, when we talk about marijuana, there's a marijuana produced in our body, there's a marijuana from plants. All right? That's the medical and recreational marijuana. And then there's the marijuana that's made by pharmaceutical companies, where they modify it and they synthetically modify it. So, I, we talked about those things. And our focus today um, is really on the phytocannabinoids. Now we learned from research that you can elevate your own endocannabinoids by doing certain things. Like when you pray, it actually elevates your endocannabinoids. How many of you exercise regularly? You know, you know, 14% of Canadians exercise regularly. We have to increase that. But those of you who run regularly, you get a high if you've been running after a while. And we used to think that was from the morphine in the body, the endorphins, but actually it's not. It's actually from your own marijuana. By the way, eating dark chocolate also elevates marijuana, but we don't want to make it Okay, so be aware of your own internal marijuana. Right? Okay. So this is how marijuana is produced in your body if you want to hear about this very quickly. Here is the, the brain, here's pain, the pain in your skin or in your joints. When the body feels the pain in the skin, the signals go along the nerves to the spinal cord, and it's this part of the spinal cord that then sends another nerve all the way to the brain. Now at this intersection here, this is the nerve firing. Just imagine that this is the nerve here, when the nerve fires these pain transmitters, um, if enough of the transmitters are fired, then the, the, the next nerve fires and then you feel pain. What happens is that God produced this in our body. The nerve here produces something called anatomide, which actually goes to the CB1 receptors, cannabinoid 1 receptors on the nerve. And by binding there, it actually slows down the firing of the nerve. It's like when you're at home and, and the fuse goes. You know, you know, you have your. It's like a like a circuit breaker, right? So these are like circuit breakers that help to slow down the pain signals. And we have these receptors in our body. The CB1 receptors are in our brain and nervous tissue, and the CB2 receptors are in um, are in the immune system. We now know that when you think about what God created, the endocannabinoids, it has two main functions. It's good for the brain, 
So if you have uh, someone with, you know, really slow brain function, like Parkinson's disease and things like that, and MS patients, multiple sclerosis, it actually helps to uplift it. And for people where the brain is too overactive, like people with psychotic episodes or the, you know, the, the patients with um, post-traumatic stress disorder, the, the cat cannabinoids will help to slow it down. It's also good for cancer. So if the immune system is down, it helps to bring it up. Um, if the immune system is overactive, like those, anybody here with psoriatic arthritis, autoimmune arthritis, lupus, it helps to bring it down. So it's homeostasis, it brings the body back into balance. That is the beautiful thing about medical marijuana. That's the good thing. And just as God created good, it can be abused and, uh, and, and lead to sin. So, um, now where's my slide on the, you know, I think I, I must have clicked the, uh, um, clicked the wrong thing here. So let me just click this here. So this, this, so realize that when you use THC, which is the recreational marijuana, it has side effects. The big side effects is dizziness, it makes you drowsy, uh, dry mouth, you lose your perception of time. So if you're like a teenager, you have an exam, you forget about it. You don't even go to school. Uh, it makes you depressed. And I'll show you some statistics in the study shortly. It makes you dizzy. You can lose your balance. You can fall. It's not good using recreational marijuana. It's not good. In fact, I, when, when uh, everything was legalized in October, my son's birthday, and he turned uh, 17 at that time, um, was the day before, and I sent an email to all my uh, my youngest and also the three older ones in university. If anyone gives you on Halloween a cookie, don't touch it. Okay, you don't know what's in it. It used to be apples with razor blades. Now it's you know, you know. So so um, watch out for any edibles because the, the response can be very delayed, right? And um, but Father Rafael, should I talk about the story or? Cookie story? You heard the story? Okay. So this is my own personal story on this. Right? So I gave a talk in London, and um, as I was driving back, the one of the um, organizers for the conference gave me a gift. And usually it's a bottle of wine. They give you a gift or you know, you know, meal tickets. But this one was actual marijuana cookies. And this is what it says right here. Um, you know, it has 9.5% uh, THC. Again, no very little, there's no CBD, 0.32% CBD. These are cookies that you can eat, and it says they'll take eat more than half at one time. So it sat on my dresser where I was in my bedroom for not just one week, it was like three or four months. And finally, one day in August, this is about three years ago, um, and, you know, it happened, I'm not, I don't, I'm not familiar with marijuana, but anyways, I said, I'm having trouble sleeping. It was a Sunday night, and I took the, the cookie, and I tried to just break off a half, right? And it started to crumble because it had been sitting there for so long. So I said, okay, I don't want to waste it. It's my uh, ethnic Chinese background. I grew up, don't waste any food. I was born here, but I immigrated from my father. And so I, I ate probably three quarters of a cookie, and I went to sleep. About two hours later, I woke up, and Annie was sleeping beside me, and, and I woke up and I felt my heart racing really fast. And my first thought was, I'm having a heart attack. And you know, that's the first thing you think of when you're... And, but then I said, okay, I don't have any chest pain, I'm not sweating, I'm not short of breath. Uh, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. So I get up and I find I'm all dizzy and it's dark. And so I, I slowly get to the bathroom and I splashed water on my face. And I said, Oh, I, I feel so bad. I have, um, you know, I just felt so, so terrible. So I, I go back into the room and, uh, and I said, You know, I have to call 911. I have to go call. I can't take this. And my wife, of course, is still sleeping in the way. And then, then I started getting paranoid. 
That's one of the side effects, paranoid ideas. And I said, oh, I'm going to end up on the front page of the Toronto Star. You know, mark of position ends up in, uh, you know. So, I, so all I could do was I grabbed my Bible that's been on me with me to every mission trip, you know, going back to the 80s. And I lay down in the couch in our bedroom and I just hung on to it. I just prayed to God, God, please get me through this. So I would fall asleep, and about 20, 30 minutes, boom, racing heart. And I just kept doing that over and over and over from about 1 or 2 in the morning to about 6 in the morning. And then I felt a little bit better. I crawled back into bed. I got up an hour later. I drove the kids to school. And I said, God, thank you for carrying me through this experience. So I, I learned. From this, you have to be really careful if you get any kind of edible, because it's all available now. I mean, you could have something, and then you eat it, and then you don't feel anything, because if you drink alcohol, you feel something, you don't feel it. And then you eat another one, and another one. And then next thing you know, you're driving on the Don Valley Parkway, it hits you, you get into a car accident. So watch out for the edibles. In fact, stay away from the edibles. Um, and I think God taught me a lesson to really rely on him, and don't take gifts from people. <laughs> okay? But I hope you don't go through that type of experience. So, really, the most important thing is you have to not use it on anybody under age 25. The brain is developing. And the studies show that if you use marijuana, you drop your IQ. In fact, um, there's an Australian study where they looked at teenagers who were using marijuana daily, like, a, like a, a type of individuals that Father Ruiz is trying to counsel, right? And from the study, they found that um, these people were 60% less likely to finish high school, right? They, they're usually marijuana. They don't feel motivated. It's called the amotivational syndrome. And the suicide rates were seven times higher. So under age 25, no recreational, period. That's what the government should do, right? Um, there's also something, if you use marijuana regularly, and this will happen in adults too, called the can cannabis use disorder. And a cannabis use disorder is where someone insists on medical treatment all the time. They use it daily. They, they, they drop out of school. They don't work. Uh, so, they become socially isolated. They're usually addicted to other products, and uh, including drugs, other drugs, um, it's seen in those with psychiatric history as well. So they're usually labeled as having a bipolar, or they could be labeled with attention deficit disorder, or these other type of conditions. And they cannot skip a dose of marijuana, and they become extremely fatigued, and there's always concern from family and friends. So that is something that needs to be screened for, right? And anybody who prescribes it, but the best thing is, if you're under age 25, don't even touch it in the developing brain. They have done studies on, again, teenagers and adults who use marijuana, and they found that here's the healthy brain, here's a marijuana user. You see all these holes in the brain? It's killing cells in your brain if you're using high THC. You do not want to be doing that. So that is a big, bad, ugly thing with marijuana. The other thing I'm really concerned about is that um, that there's now on the street other types of marijuana. There's all these synthetic marijuana that are even more powerful, and people die from it. You get these zombie outbreaks that's been published in studies. Um, not just people like the police officers running up in, into a tree when they also ate some brownies. You, know, you, you have to really watch out for the recreational. Pot cookies sending teens to the hospital in Oshawa. Probably having a similar experience to what I had the one time when I tried it. Now, what about, so we tell people if you're a teen, ager, stay away from recreational marijuana. Okay, this, this is that. Now, there are some children who are put on marijuana, but it's not THC, it's high CBD for seizures, seizure disorders. Uh, the youngest in, in the world is a seven-year-old Landon Riddle, who is on high CBD oils for his leukemia. He's battling leukemia, and he is in the United States for that. 
the highest group of people though in the world in Canada using marijuana medically, the biggest group are older seniors, baby boomers, and those of us 60 and above. Most of us have pain, and, and so we're seeing a lot of use in this with our seniors. And the problem is when you're put on such medications, if it's THC, it can make you dizzy. You can fall. But at the same time, if the CBD, the medical part, is controlling the inflammation in your joints and your pain, well then you can actually not fall. You can have better control. So there's a balance between the medical and the recreation, right? between THC and CBD. And we now know there are side effects with CBD itself. CBD actually has an effect on the liver. And if you look at the liver, um, it can actually interfere with other drugs. And that can also make you dizzy and fall. So you have to be careful if you're using the CBD oils that it could have an effect on the liver. So this is my, sort of my second last slide where I say, yes, it's a gateway drug into addiction, and it is bad. Uh, but for people who are already addicted, and they're on morphine, they're on um, taking all these sleeping pills that are not good for you, and medications, it is a stepping stone to come out of those type of um, medications. A gateway drug in, and a gateway drug out. And when you look at the, how, how lethal marijuana is, you would literally have to eat 1,500 pounds of marijuana in 15 minutes to cause death. Whereas with morphine drugs, Tylenol, you can take 20 Tylenol extra strength at one time and kill your liver and die, right? So marijuana is safer in that sense compared to other, other uh, medications out there, especially the um, uh, other drugs like alcohol and things like that. So, as I said, um, you know, this is Sanjay Gupta, he basically said that um, every 10 minutes, someone dies from taking a prescription drug. Every 10 minutes, when we look at our statistics. It does not happen with medical marijuana. It doesn't happen with medical marijuana, okay? So I think, uh, I think I'm gonna just close this part here. I see some of you uh, nodding off here, right? So maybe I'll take some questions. Uh, okay. Actually, any questions right now? with some of the producers where the doctor prescribes it, they run out, the company runs out of it, and the person on the other end of the phone says, well, I'll, I'll send you something else instead. And they're given something with maybe, instead of 20 to under one, they're given 10 CBD and 10 THC, and then these patients have major side effects from giving that. So you have to be very careful that any producer um, stays with consults the physician prescribing it. So th that's a very good question. Yep. Is it over the counter medication or is it just like prescribed? Over the, over the counter, which you buy recreationally, you can ask for whatever percent you want. Uh, the, the, the companies are really geared for more recreational purposes, right? So high THC. 
And the advantage of having it prescribed is someone supervises you, and you can also claim it on your income tax too, because it's a medical expense. Yeah. The THC, yes. high dose THC, oh, okay. can, can affect the brain. Uh, so there's studies showing that um, you can stop the THC, you can start to repair the brain. Um, for example, we have a lot of our patients using omega-3 fish oil, which is good for the brain. We have them also change their diet. They become much more plant-based with their diet. And we actually uh, teach a program for different church groups called the Daniel Plan. It's a modification of that plan where we go over what to eat uh, diet-wise, and I'll show you a slide on that as well. And there's also newer techniques to actually build the brain, uh, whereas technology that's come from the uh, University of Wisconsin for people with brain injuries and strokes, where you apply a stimulator to the tongue that activates the cells of the brain and gets it to activate again. But long-term use can lead to long-term consequences, right, with, with the brain. And, I, I, you know, it's, it's wiser not to, uh, yeah? I have a question. So, can I be the old, right, CBD? Right. And now the technology is coming to the brain, right? So, if you do CBD, this alone, the studies show that it's not addictive because you're not smoking it or vaporizing it and it doesn't make you feel high. It's addictive if you feel high, and I, I tell people that if, you, if you're smoking, you want THC, and smoked a bit, it's like taking a, a Percocet or these oxy, oxycodone drugs, fentanyl, right? But if you're doing CBD, you avoid that. Now CBD has side effects, high dose, uh, where it can affect the liver. And the one that's used for ch uh, childhood seizures, um, which, uh, I don't know if I have a slide of that, like the Dravet syndrome, right? These are kids with seizures that were uncontrolled. She was getting 200 seizures a day, you know, with all the medications. And her parents said enough's enough. They took her to Colorado. She got Charlotte's Web, which is um, pure um, CBD at a much higher dose. Now it's available as a drug called the Pidiolex. It has 100 milligrams of CBD in one mil. But the cost is $1,300 for 100 mils. It's really, really expensive. But here, seizures dropped. So these type of people will not get addicted because they're using it for medical purposes to control things. And they do not experience a, a psychological craving for it. Yeah. Right. So, I think, um, I'll see if I can um, <coughs> see, find the slides of what to do here. Um, so, you, you, if you're going to um, purchase things, go for things, you have to ask yourself, why am I getting this? And if it's for recreational purposes, then all I can say is be very, very careful. In fact, I don't encourage it. Um, the police will now pull you over uh, if they smell marijuana in the car, right? And I don't know if I have that, that slide of uh, the marijuana here. I might have gone past it here. Um, so the marijuana, uh, and what they will do if they smell marijuana, just like if they smell alcohol, is they'll have you uh, get outside and they'll have you do their testing. And if you fail the testing, they will do blood tests and they can get saliva samples. Now the saliva testing, the breathalyzer is very accurate for alcohol. There is no breathalyzer test for marijuana. But just from being incapacitated, they can take away your car and you can be charged and they can go beyond that. Right? They're, they're working on this. Yeah, yeah. You have to see a doctor. So I, I do. I, I do consulting work with the Apollo Cannabis Clinic, and they're in North York, not far from here. They're just on Don Mills, uh, Duncan Mill Road. But they have a, a good group of doctors. They're one of the few with a, a pediatric specialist as well for those who are younger, and they have two psychiatrists who can uh, work with people who have 
um, you know, comorbid type of I issues. You, you need medical supervision and direction. So when I see a patient at Sunnybrook with pain, if I say, oh, it's outside my scope, they have all these uh, help risk factors or they have an addiction history, I refer them to people who are, are better qualified and trained. Yep. Is any of them affecting the uh, endorphin uh, naturally induced in, in our bodies, like just like the other type of uh, uh, drugs? Yeah, you're asking some very good scientific questions. So there is an effect that cannabis has, the THC has on uh, morphine as well. And in fact, they found that if you put people on the medical cannabis, you don't have to take as much of the morphine drugs. They work on different receptors, right? They work on different receptors, the cannabinoid receptors versus the opioid receptors. And by helping the cannabinoid receptor work properly, then you can really start to reduce the morphine drugs. So there is an interaction between the two. And we know also that CBD has an effect on the morphine receptor itself. CBD does not really have an effect on the marijuana receptors in the body. It actually works on different receptors. And that's a common mistake made. They think, oh, THC works on one type of cannabinoid receptor and CBD on the other. It's actually THC works on both cannabinoid receptors. CBD helps to um, reduce the effect of the THC on the cannabinoid receptors, but it also works on other, probably about eight or nine other receptors in the body involved um, with pain and movement and, and memory. Right. Okay, uh, just my, yeah. my, yeah, I understand this point, but um, you know that the other, other stuff of the drugs, it sometimes, it affects those kind of naturally infused in our body, so it's not coming back regularly. So when you stop the, the drug, there's something like um, a, a, a time to come back to your natural or like the, the body start to uh, introduce the, the, the substance again. That's right, so that's, that's called tolerance. Yes, tolerance. Yes, and that happens with CBD as well. So you're right about that. And our, our, our uh, I think God's called us to help to minister to the, especially our church communities about what to do to help people not have to take medications long term, right? So we look at exercise, uh, we look at uh, sleep, nutrition. Uh, there's something called the blue zones. Do you, have you heard about the blue zones? The blue zones are the five places in the world where people live the longest with the best quality of life. And we know, for example, the men live the longest in a place called Italy, Sardinia. And the women live the longest in Okinawa, Japan. But both men and women live the longest in, uh, in the Nokoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, which we went to visit on a family trip two years ago. And what they found was that these, these um, five, these blue zones, they all have something in common that they do. That's called the power of nine blue zones. A very common thing is they are part of a church community. They have the faith. Faith is actually good for your body. You know, it's having a life purpose and gratitude is really important. But also activity, exercise. And also taking a siesta, a nap in the afternoon. So I'm trying to change my habits now where I take a nap. And that way I won't be taking, you know, I won't take any medication. I don't want to be taking any pills. Now, if you've had a heart attack or stroke, then the benefits of taking medication outweighs, you know, you, you need to be on, you know, those medications to protect you from having another heart attack. So it's a fine. But for those of you who are not on any medications, try to keep your body healthy and avoid this. I think for the four of us, none of us are on any medications so far, right? Yeah. So far, so we're, we're trying to walk the talk. Right? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Um, just wondering if there are any studies around long-term medicinal use of marijuana, because if people are coming off of other medications, like that, that period might be really prolonged. So are we saying that the effects of that outweighs what they're taking already in terms of what we know chronically? Well, you bring up a really good point. People would say, I mean, this goes into science and evidence. The science on how marijuana works in the laboratory with animals, very strong, very good. They, they identify the different uh, compounds. The clinical science is weak. You know, we don't have really big long-term 10, 
20 year studies. Um, and the biggest studies are pharmaceutical cannabis called the Sativex spray, which you can get in Canada for cancer pain and multiple sclerosis pain. And you spray that under the tongue. So that, the biggest study they have is on two, over 2,000 patients followed for two years. And then they have an open label study followed for five years. And again, there is some tolerance that develops, but again, that's about the best evidence that we have for now. So if you're going to take it every day for the rest of your life, I don't recommend it. You know, if you're going to be using it to get off the drugs you're taking daily for pain, that's my back, my specialty in chronic pain work, then yes, it could be a gateway medication to get you out of the bad drugs. But to use it recreationally, I, I agree with Father Bruce, I would not even cross that boat. If you can, you know. Now, if you're trying to counsel people like that um, and get them off the medications, they would have to see a, um, an addiction uh, specialist that deals with the youth at KMH and uh, at the Apollo Clinic. They, uh, Apollo Williams is very good at working with, uh, with uh, teenagers who need to learn how to come off that. And in those type of patients, um, you know, you have to look at the body, mind, spirit. You know, you have to ask them, well, um, what happened to you as a child? You know, how are your parents? Like, what's going on in the family type, type of issue? But it, it used to take me 15 minutes to do a consult. Now when I see a patient at Sunnybrook, it's an hour and a half with one patient. Because I, I ask them about, you know, what did you eat? And how, how do you exercise? And what church do you go to? What, what's your faith? Because that's important too. Right? So, yes, question. Yeah. The oils, the oil, how it works? So the oils work um, by, you take the oil, you usually, you know, I didn't bring up any syringes with me, but you start with the, if you are very sensitive, the safest way to take the oil is to have no THC in it, minimal under 1% THC. You get a toothpick, you dip it in the oil, and you taste it. And you wait two or three hours, see how you respond. I have some patients that are so sensitive, they take one taste and then they feel dizzy and they're reacting. Um, I have had some unusual reactions to the CBD oil, which I think is tied with their liver not working as well. But usually you take, you know, and then you then use the 0.5 small amount of um, of the CBD oil at nighttime. You always start at nighttime because you don't know how it may affect you in terms of driving and, and working. And then you, after a few days, you can bring it up to a, a little higher dose, 0.75 cc, until you get some pain relief. And usually that's around one to two cc's at, at night if you're uncomplicated. But again, the doctors at the clinics that we, we work with uh, we'll teach you how to do that, and they'll be in touch by phone, and, and they'll give you a plan. Uh, if you're very, very risky, if you have a lot of drugs, they should ask you to come back after two weeks to, to do a follow-up. And they have to be very careful in working with your pharmacist as well, because there's all these interactions that can happen. So if you're going to do it, do it with medical supervision and guidance, which should help. Yep. Yep. Pastoral counseling. Yes. What advice would you give, like our our priests, but also the like the people who work with youth in our church? Yeah. Um, like we, we don't have the hour and a half of the medical training necessarily to yeah. do all the counseling on that end. But what what practical things would you suggest when we're speaking to youth who are either starting or struggling with it, and especially getting to the underlying causes of why they're using? Yeah, that's uh, so just, yeah. Uh, just before, so I can add actually on the question because it's kind of interrelation. Um, I wanted also to know, maybe to build on that question, from your experience, uh, we said that um, it's almost completely forbidden if you're between 18 to 25 because it's the most dangerous age where your brain is being developed. Um, the highest people that are using the THC usually are between 18 to 25, or, you know, that's the unfortunate part of the society. So from your experience, what are the early signs for us as parents, for siblings, for Sunday school teacher, for us as priests, 
what are the early signs that we're able to see from someone that is using THC so that we're able to be proactive and to resolve the question? Well, I think for what the early signs are any change in their level of function. And usually as parents, we always worry about schoolwork. So if you see a, a sudden drop, um, and if you see them become more withdrawn, depressed, if you smell, I mean, marijuana has an odor, a distinct odor. So if you smell things in your clothing, uh, you have to track who the friends are. So with our children, we usually invite their friends over, and we get to meet them, and we, you know, we, we keep an eye open, right? You, you have to look for that. But, the first signs are, are going to be a change in the, the way they interact and things like that. Now, Dr. Dr. Hum is a family doctor, so you have probably some patients. You might have some comments on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've seen in my practice uh, with some of the teenagers that are involved. Um, it's, it's similar to what uh, uh, Gord said. Um, look for some early rebellious signs in the house. We usually they start when they're still in public school, not even in high school anymore. Um, some attitude changes, things like that. Some of that could be normal. They're just um, trying to find themselves and their identity. But if you see some behaviors that are a little bit outside of the expected norm, you do have to uh, be concerned. And I think, as he said, um, really be aware of who they hang out with uh, because um, you become who your friends are. So um, their friends have a huge, huge influence on them. Unfortunately nowadays it's not just physical friends, it's also social media friends. So it's people that um, they might just be strangers but they connect with every day and you don't have the privilege of knowing who those people are. Um, so do the best you can to Keep that line of communication open with them. It's important not to come across as critical or judgmental because the moment you do that, their back is up against the wall and they will shut down. They will not want to reveal anything to you. So it's important that you come across lovingly and uh, but still at the same time guide them. And if you do see um, some strange behaviors, some smells, going to parties, um, uh, lack of motivation, as he said, you know, not wanting to concentrate in school, things like that, then, then you, those are really good clues that they're headed down that path. Oh, yeah. So, I, I, you know, it, it really, um, it really comes down to uh, having, having that, uh, the right world view. And um, I have you know colleagues of mine who they don't believe in God. You know, I have one fellow who grew up in Russia and he was and he says, Well, Lord, when I die I'm gonna have my body frozen like Michael Jackson and home plate. But I, I tell them the world's gonna be, you know, dissolved in the future, right? And, and until Jesus comes back again. And, and uh, so um, I think getting people grounded with God is so important. I say there's four things that um, I try to convey at the right time to our, our children and also to uh, my patients. One, there is a God, and uh, you know God is holy, God is loving, and people, we are created, there's people, we are created in His image, but we are sinful. And thirdly, and this is the crux of what we all believe in, Jesus came, died for us, and rose again. And lastly, when you come to that, those terms, then repenting, turning away from the past, or you know, and, and really uh, following in faith to Jesus. And you, having that foundation it is, is so crucial. I mean, I talk to my, my, my kids and patients, okay, here's the financial aspects of life, relational aspects, physical, which uh, we specialize in, but the spiritual tends to be most neglected in our society. And 
Uh, one of my favorite passages, um, that maybe is the right time, St. Augustine. He said, take care of your body, take care of your body as if you were going to live forever. But take care of your soul as if you were going to die tomorrow. Like Kobe Bryant and some stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, be part of, be baptized, you know, part of the church. That is so important. Right? And, and Dr. Lawson is going to have a few pearls. Uh, because when it comes to dealing with uh, baby boomers, he's the best example. And uh, I think you're turning, can I say your age? Uh, you're turning 70. Am I? Two months. <laughs> but, but, you know, so old. Five, five years ago, he, uh, he rode the Italian Alps. Okay? And was the oldest in the group and the only one to finish with the 20 year olds. And he still plays hockey. And, uh, yeah, you had, so, you know, why am I so short? Uh, that's the answer. I, I, uh, I, we had a child, my wife and I were having three children, but we had a child that went through high use of marijuana. And it's heartbreaking, isn't it, to see, to see young people in your parish taking marijuana. I, I worked 15 years down at uh, Young Street Mission, uh, Evergreen, they have a, a street youth clinic. And it's heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking to see these young people come in between the ages of 14 and 25. And so many of them are on drugs. So many of them are on drugs. Having, having seen hundreds of young people abusing drugs, having gone through with our own, our own son, what are, some of the experience that I've gained is, is one, maintain relationships. No, no matter what, maintain the dialogue in the relationship. As Gore mentioned, keep part of the community and, and uh, their, their, their friends and pray constantly. It, it, it really is difficult. I, I remember, and most, uh, when we were going through our darkest time with our son, who was abusing drugs quite a bit, I remember I spoke with the director of Young Street Mission, and I asked him, uh, I told him what, what can I do? What can we do? What possibly changes can we make in, in this young, in our son's children? We love our children. We love those in our parish. And some of the advice was comforting from, from the standpoint, as I, as I mentioned, and Gord mentioned, and Andy mentioned. But one of the things that was helpful, is he said, you know, most of the children that go through this, most of them do come through. There's very, very dark periods. There, there's a very, a great deal of challenge. But holding on with the prayer, the support, the community, and, and, I, and I can tell you as walking into this church, I feel the love of this community. Your children will have experienced that. And that is, that is helpful. Very few don't come back. Our own son, he, it was a journey back. And uh, he's, he's come through. He's, he's, a, he's, he's a teacher and, and has a great deal of desire now to help and serve. So there is there's hope, and our greatest hope is in our Lord Jesus. Which uh, happens to be that I have been trying so many times to send the people over there. Either I get the patient himself or herself reluctant to go, and even if he or she would like to go, then the hospital has a waiting list. Although I have also some experience with this hospital that if they admitted someone, they are very kind to him or her and some successful cases. How to get into this? It's the only hospital that can help youth with both the drug, the marijuana and the depression. How can the system is so very little with the number of people who need? Um, that's a challenge with uh, our, our OHIP type system where we can get 
services accessed very quickly. Um, it really comes down to having building some bridges and making some uh, connections. I mean, there's a at KMH, there's an Andrew, Dr. Andrew Smith, who's a, a neurologist doing pain work, and he sees people with addictions. And sometimes I'll try to make a phone call or an email, try to get people in faster. Um, but that's we have to make those connections. We need to have our church communities know which doctors out there are number one Christian. That would be really helpful because then you know they have the same moral view. And and I have prayed with my patients even when I when I see them. That's that's so important. But we need to maybe build a network um, of how we can get our, our um, different church systems connected with the, the medical professions. I don't have a I don't have an answer right now. Is there any alternative to Kamesh? Because it's so small and the waiting list is so long. Uh, well, I know some doctors, I'll give you their names. I'll give you a list of names of doctors that specialize in addiction as well. Um, I mentioned, uh, and actually there's a handout here uh, from the government that you're all getting uh, sent to you. There's, there's one is from KMH, one is from uh, the OMA, Ontario Medical Association, the other is from Health Canada, and their recognitions about marijuana. And I think um, with the, on the back of one of them is the contact information on the Apollo Clinic, and that might be a good resource that's nearby that you could access as well. I could try to speak to the uh, owner and the manager of the top positions and see if they can maybe be with you to help have, have the right connections there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I believe in prevention better than food. Right, right. Now they are around those cookies, even through the Amazon or the Those cookies can be handed the, the buyer to the parents. Now the children can have access to it and take it to the school. And you know the the little ones can exchange. How to prevent it? How to control this? And in the meantime, some parents, I believe, if they see the kids are hyper, they will give them the marijuana so they can go down. And also they can buy it from the street and make cookies or whatever for kids. How can you control? I am assuming that can happen. Yes, it can happen. And it has happened. And uh, usually when we have people taking any prescription drugs, they should keep it locked safely. Um, and I was at, at a medical meeting recently where the anesthetist, pain specialist, he talked about his two young children coming across some morphine drugs that he had in the, and if they had taken it, they would not be around today. Or if the dog had eaten it, they, the dog would be affected. So you have to have things under lock and key. Um, the, the marijuana companies are supposed to educate anybody buying it, but who reads the fine print, right? Yeah, so we have to try to educate the public. Yeah, I mean they look at they look after if you can't bring cookies in with nuts. You know, we just have to be as strict as we can about cannabis as well. That's, that's a good point. Thank yep. you. Now, the freeze, that the use, that they come to me at every stage, for example, to say, for example, we started with drive and stuff like that. What is the best way to approach it? If the youth are coming to you, um, I, I, yeah, this doesn't, I mean, Dr. Moss probably has some thoughts too, and Dr. Gillis. Um, build a relationship with them, find out why they even want to even try it, or, you know, is it because of your friends? You know, what kind of friends do you have? I mean, it's like um, when our son tried alcohol for the first time, I said, if you can try any alcohol, I want you to try it at home, right? Don't be doing it in the street public. If they're given something, okay, well, the worst thing you can do is maybe do it, try a little, 
been at home, and that way you, you, you see what we're in the families here. Um, but I would like to be strict. I said, no marijuana beer. <laughs> As a parent, I, I say, none. I, I, sorry, we just don't tolerate it. So I don't get any other suggestions, Sue? Well, I think you, you made a very good point. You made a very good point. No, I agree with him. But just, just a very good He was self-medicating. So really, we want to understand why do they want to have marijuana? So is it the friends and the pure pressure so try and understand what are the pressures that they're under. Why do they feel the need? What is the unmet need? Right? And so because it makes them feel good, well, what else could make them feel good? Right? Exercise, getting them involved in a group that's playing basketball or you have things here in the church, right? Getting them with a church community that's not going to be leading them to do drugs at parties and things happen when people are under, uh, under the influence, right? So I think that's the most important thing, and listening. And so uh, one of the things I think, looking back to, is driving places, right? I would say, well, you can take the transit. And honestly, right, I didn't have the time to take them to all these things. But those are missed opportunities if you can get them off their phone. <laughs> now I think it's hard, right? Because they're on the phone the whole time. But you can also have rules about that. If you want to ride, you can't be on your phone. I'm going to take the time out of my day because I want to be with you. I want to hear from you. I want to know what's going on with you. Right? So that's the most important thing, is just to be aware of what is the need, the unmet need, that they are turning to drugs for or any behavior that is and often a spiritual solution, right? That is, they're not going to get anywhere but here. So that's super important, is keeping them engaged in that so they never feel alone. Because I think, just to make a point about suicide, because I think that's another thing that is uh, increasing. Um, and it says a lot that people think the world would be better off without mental health needs in young and old, right, where they're not feeling loved. And we have the love of Christ to tap into. And it's so available, 24-7. And I think that they need to know. And so I remember years ago, one of our neighbors, their kids went to an Awanas group. Do you know Awanas? It's like a, a young people's, like her boys were coming with our kids, and I was taking them there. So one day she came, and she said, well, I said, oh, you know, Dad, good to see you. And she said, well, I want to find out why do we want to come here? You know, like she was afraid that I was going to proselytize them, and, you know, right? And so she came and watched, you know, and they were playing basketball, and they were having fun. And so she said, well, seem pretty normal. Like, you know, they weren't going, you know, you must, kind of thing. Uh, so, that we don't love them. And that no one loves them. And they might do something really stupid. They might commit suicide. And I said, I want them to know that they are never alone. They are never alone. God is with them. So even when they feel like nobody loves them, and the world would be better off without them, they don't know. God brought us all here, and um, we're here to share. I'm, I'm going to just close with two Bible verses. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. This is Paul talking, right? And everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. I will not be mastered by THC, for example. And we know that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in, in us. So body, mind, spirit, we need to, to look after that. Okay, I think. And uh, Baha Bashi, he's Coptic. And he's our mentor. And he's working with us on a, a wellness program in the future, right? Oh, really? So you, you may know about that. You know? <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> and um, 
and then also the, the, Orthodox, the Orthodoxy Church has a whole, uh, I think it's a 10 page or three page position paper on, on medical on cannabis and what's it like. And basically, what I've shared with you uh, today uh, matches that. It's, it's, it's you know, they, they gain, they basically, we've got to watch out for uh, There's a little legitimate use medically, but watch out if you don't get you know, swept in to the other things. So that's something you can also download. Thank you very much, Dr. Cole. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hung, Dr. Jillis, and Dr. Lawson for being with us, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you, everybody, for actually staying and taking the time really to get to, to know what's happening in our society, what are the substances that we're dealing with that our kids are exposed to. I'm going to leave you with something very, very small. I think we learned a lot, but uh, bottom line, it's back to love as I think uh, Dr. Jilla said. Back to love, we need to love our kids. And uh, I'm gonna um, you know, share with you something, but all our young kids, when they start reading, we do with them a very nice exercise. We get them that illustrator Bible, and we start reading with them. And it's just a couple of verses with like big pictures, and we show them the picture, because this is the way that they learn. But the more they grow and with time they're able to read more and the picture becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until there's no picture in the Bible and you know who are the picture? You and me in the house. It's us as a family. It's me as a father and you as a mother that are the picture of this Bible that they are reading. So let's love them the way that God loves us like in 1 Corinthians 13 chapter of love. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. And on behalf of the church, Dr. Gordon, I would love just to uh, give you something small, um, Father Ruiz. That's on behalf of the church, all the fathers. Thank you so much for your time and everything. Yes, we'll take a picture.